Hello everybody and welcome back to Microbiology. Today we'll be discussing microbial genetics. To do so, we'll have to first understand what genetic material is. And genetic material is very important because it defines the structure and function of microbes. All living organisms store their genetic material as DNA. However, um, viruses store their uh, genetic material as DNA or RNA. So let's do a little review of our basic biology and discuss how the structure of DNA looks like, how it's packaged in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, and what are the essential functions of DNA. DNA is made up of building blocks called nucleotides. Nucleotides are made up of three different molecules that are uh, all interconnected. One is a phosphate group, which has a phosphorus atom in the middle, and it is surrounded with oxygens. This is linked to a sugar molecule. The sugar molecule in DNA is deoxyribose. Ribose is a type of sugar, just like glucose or fructose. And it is the deoxy form. That means that one of the oxygen groups has been removed. So instead of having an OH on this second uh, group here, it just has an H group. And we'll discuss that in more detail later. Finally, uh, all of these have a nitrogenous base attached to them, sometimes just referred to as a base. There are four bases in DNA that make up the code. The first one listed here is adenine, abbreviated as A. The next is guanine, abbreviated as G, cytosine as C, and thymine as T. These building blocks are linked together through what is known as a phosphodiester bond. So remember that we had a phosphate that is attached to the sugar. And these phosphates act as a bridge connecting one, uh, one nucleotide base to the next. So if we examine this phosphate group in between these two ribose sugars, uh, we'll notice that on either side of the phosphate, there is an oxygen that links to the other sugar. And this is called a diester bond because uh, this O, O, double O structure here is an ester, and there's two esters on either side of the phosphate. So this PO2 is one of the esters, and on the other side is another PO2 for the second ester. What happens is um, cells can take one nucleotide and through a reaction called a condensation reaction it can uh, create uh, two molecule or take two molecules and combine them together um, it's referred to as a condensation reaction because uh, just like condensation when you think of rain the product of which includes water so it removes one hydrogen from one of the riboses and an OH group from one of the phosphates, and we're just left with that single oxygen that remains in the molecule to create this diester bond, and a H2O recombine from these two original molecules, and so we get a little bit of water, one water per bond that is formed. So if we wanted to build a DNA molecule from scratch, here's how it would work, starting with a single here we have a adenine nucleotide and attached to the third carbon of its membrane ring, first, second, third carbon, we have this phosphate that attaches through a condensation reaction. And so we've attached a cytosine here. And this can be done again and again, a guanine, a thymine, and a cytosine again. And as you can see, no matter what nucleotide base we use, we always have the same sort of reaction and bridge this phosphodiester bond that links the two together. As this is accomplished, a new structure emerges from this uh, DNA that is formed. This structure is referred to as the backbone of the DNA. So on each strand, you can imagine that there is this phospho 
uh, a phosphate group and a ribose group that are attached to each other, alternating between each, and this makes up the backbone. And uh, another piece of DNA can bind to the first piece of DNA, and this creates what we call the double helix. Something that's interesting about these nitrogenous bases in the middle is they have these extra hydrogen and OH groups, hydroxyl groups, that are available to interact with another nucleotide base. And their structure and spacing is thus that an adenine can uh, hydrogen bond, is what this is called, when an oxygen and a hydrogen interact with each other, an adenine can hydrogen bond to a thymine. And it does so with exactly two hydrogen bonds. And again, a cytosine can interact with a guanine, and it does so with its three hydrogen bonds. So no matter what, we can only have an AT or TA pair up with each other, or a CG or a GC pairing up. And remember, this is called a hydrogen uh, bond that occurs between these two strands. These hydrogen bonds are not as strong as these other bonds we've seen in the rest of the molecule. Uh, the other bonds here are called covalent bonds, and they're a lot more sturdy than the hydrogen bonds. And you'll see that that is very important when it comes to uh, using DNA in order to uh, accomplish the production of genes and replication. And so together, the two strands are called complementary strands, and they always end in opposite components of the backbone. One ends in a sugar, and the other ends in a phosphate. So you see this first strand at the very bottom component is a sugar, the ribose, and then the other strand, which has to go in the opposite direction, will end in a phosphate. This has to be done this way in order for these, bond, these hydrogen bonds to match up. Now, in reality, the um, DNA does not sit flat like this. It has a three-dimensional structure, and uh, it looks more like this, and we're all familiar with uh, this drawing, this cartoon depiction. And this is what we call the double helix. So it's double because there are two strands of DNA, and we can see that the uh, Gs bind to the Cs and As bind to the Ts. And we have the backbone is drawn here, and this backbone, you shall remember, is the phosphate and ribose sugar that line the backbone. And we have something called the minor groove, which is the distance between the backbones here, and the major groove, which is the distance between one backbone to the lower backbone here. And uh, so this creates what sort of looks like a spiral staircase. Now let's discuss further about the numbering system of the sugar and um, how we use this to understand DNA. So if any sugar that you take, it has a series of carbons within its ring. And uh, here we have one extra carbon that lies outside of the ring. And scientists have to have a way to uh, identify which carbon they're talking about. So they decided to name these carbons. If you go clockwise from the oxygen, they start with the first one. So the first carbon is always going to be the one closest to the O in a clockwise circle. And so this first carbon is labeled one prime. The second carbon is two prime. The third carbon is three prime. The fourth is four prime. The fifth is five prime. And if you uh, will recall from your basic chemistry courses, any of these points here that you see or when two lines come together, that represents a carbon that exists there. Um, we just forego writing carbon so that we don't uh, overcomplicate the drawing. So now we can start to talk about the directionality of DNA. As you recall, we have a phosphate group that's bound here, and this ribose can link to some other uh, um, 
nitrogen space or some other nucleotide below it. So this oxygen is available and drawn here with the dotted line, but not included, to bind to another phosphate group down here. So this own nucleotide has its phosphate group bound to its five prime carbon. And it has the three prime group available to bind to some other nucleotides phosphate. So when we look at this image, we should know that every five prime group should have a phosphate bound to it in a nucleotide. And if we want to bind another base to this, we can bind it to the hydroxyl group here of the sugar and form another phosphate down here and form a phosphodiester bond. Or we can bind this base to some other uh, sugar above it. So you should be able to identify which carbon is the first, second, third, fourth, and five prime and what should be attached to it. For example, the first prime should always have the nitrogenous base bound to it. The five prime will have a phosphate group bound to it. If this particular base was at the end of a DNA strand, then the three prime would be an OH group. If it was in the middle of a DNA strand, then this three prime end would be bound to a phosphodiester bond. Checkpoint one, which end of a single nucleotide has a phosphate group attached to it? So scientists have learned a lot about DNA based upon its structure. Before DNA was discovered, a man named Gregor Mendel had, dis had associated um, certain phenotypes with what he called, uh, referred to as genes. And he believed that genes were discrete units that were heritable. Um, however, scientists did not know what the uh, molecular mechanism was, what the, uh, what the source was for these genes. And the uh, most common explanation was that these were from proteins because there were many, many proteins that were found in cells. And so it was thought that that could explain this sort of heritable trait. Well, along came a few scientists and you might recognize some of these names. We have James Watson to the far left and we have Francis Crick standing uh, next to him and Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins. Now, James Watson and Francis Crick were uh, uh, biochemists and Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins were really good at X-ray crystallography. In particular, Rosalind Franklin uh, had a lot of contributions to the understanding of the structure of DNA. So as you can imagine, cells are very small and difficult to observe underneath a light microscope. And so to observe DNA, which is much smaller than a cell, these scientists had to use something called X-ray diffraction. And what you're looking at here is an X-ray diffraction of DNA. And uh, Rosalind Franklin kind of was a uh, artist at doing these sorts of images. It took, took a little bit of talent in order to get these really sharp images. And from these images, Francis Crick and James Watson were able to discern the structure of DNA. And here, uh, I believe it's uh, Francis Crick, I believe this is Francis Crick, standing next to a model of DNA. So from that uh, image like this, they were able to decipher that the DNA had a phosphodiester backbone, that it had nitrogenous spaces in the middle. Uh, they realized it had a double helix that had a minor groove and a major groove and what the nitrogenous spaces were. So you might wonder, all right, we have the structure. How do we get from the structure and, a, and um, from that derive the concept that DNA is where our genetic information is stored. And I pulled up the original paper that was published in 1974. 
and it's entitled Molecular Structure of Nucleic Acids, a Structure for Deoxyribose Nucleic Acid. And here is their own original figure, their uh, cartoon depiction of how this DNA molecule should have looked like. And as you can see, they, they, as you can see, they even have this uh, anti-parallel um, complementary nature drawn in the backbones where they knew that one strand had to go from five prime to three prime and the other strand had to go in the opposite direction, three prime to five prime in order for those nitrogenous bases to hydrogen bond to one another. And they have a very interesting quote here in their discussion section. In the discussion section, often you will have scientists who provide the implications of their work and where further research should be done. And in this discussion section, they say it reads, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. Full details of the structure, including the conditions assuming, assumed in building it, together with a set of coordinates for the atoms, will be published elsewhere. So because one DNA strand, you can predict what the other strand will look like, because again, it's anti-parallel and A's always must bind to T, they assumed that you could write one another strand based on the first strand. And therefore they're saying that they can postulate a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. So now let's revisit the structure of the double-stranded DNA molecule. And we see if we take a individual nucleotide on the five prime carbon, we have our overhanging phosphate group. And on the three prime end, we ha should have that hydroxyl group hanging off at the end because um, we don't have another phosphodiester bond from the next nucleotide to fill its place. And um, on the other strand, it has to run in the reverse direction. So the five prime end is actually at the bottom and the three prime end of this DNA molecule is at the top. And so this is called the anti-parallel, the way they're situated, because they run in the same plane, but in opposite directions. And they are also called complementary because of that feature that we discussed about A's always binding the T's. So if I was to block this half of the DNA strand so that you could only see one strand, you should be able to look at this other strand and be able to draw this strand without ever seeing it. And as a reminder, again, the phosphate group should be on the five prime end and the sugar should be on the three prime end. So what that means is that one strand tells the story of the other and that this provides a mechanism for copying one strand into a new strand. If the existing strand of DNA contained the following nucleotide sequence, CAT, CAT, GACT, what would be the sequence of the new strand of DNA synthesized by the cell? Go ahead and take a moment and see if you can figure out what bases you would write for the other strand. Okay, if you took this template strand and you tried to tell the story of the other strand, it should look something like this. You should have a G T A G T A C T G A. That's because C's always bind the G's and A's always bind the T's. And you can work all the way down the line here, here and write the new letters. Okay, so how is DNA packaged in prokaryotes and how is it packaged in eukaryotes? Prokaryotes have a relatively simple way of packaging their DNA. Um, as we've discussed, it, it, it exists as one large circular chromosome depicted here in red, 
and we can have multiple small circular plasmids, which are extra chromosomal pieces of DNA. And the bacterial DNA is stored in what is known as the nucleoid region. This is not a nucleus. And so the nucleus is not contained, or the nucleoid region is not contained in its own organelle that is membrane limited. In eukaryotes, they're much different. They tend to have multiple, uh, not always, but they tend to have multiple copies of their chromosomes. They are always linear and they are highly supercoiled around histones. We'll discuss what the supercoiling is in a moment. And they are stored in the nucleus. This is a depiction of eukaryotic DNA structure. So we can start by just looking you know, at the nitrogenous bases, the, the nucleotide bases themselves, and remember they're complementary and anti-parallel. Um, <clears throat> however, this is not, actually none of this is really, really how it looks um, in nature naturally. These are, are sort of cartoonish depictions, but we can kind of extrapolate the ideas from here. Um, the DNA is actually exists as a double helix. Um, however, Eukaryotes like to package their DNA. So they form what are called supercoils. Supercoils are when, if you imagine like a uh, headphones, if, if you spin it too much or a hose, it will start to wrap around itself again. So instead of just being spun and twisted like this, it starts to twist amongst this back over itself in a single strand. So if we were to zoom in on here, that's what it would look like. It would, it would twist over itself again. And these histones are proteins that help provide stability and uh, denseness to this uh, DNA strand. And so these histones help pack the DNA strand into what is called chromatin. And chromatin can be even more highly compacted into what we call the chromosomes, which many of you have probably remember seeing these chromosomal-like structures. Um, these chromosomes uh, have a certain shape to them based upon the structure, uh, which is unique to each species. So what are the essential functions of DNA? Well, DNA is important for inheritance. So DNA is passed down from parent to offspring. And in order to do so, DNA must be accurately copied into new molecules. This is called DNA replication. DNA is also important in that it serves as a blueprint. So DNA doesn't isn't just uh, handy uh, isn't just like a picture on the wall that's nice to have there. It does serve a purpose. For the cell so it stores information about structures and functions of the cell the information in dna must be converted into proteins and to do so the cell does a process called transcription and translation for this first lecture we're going to focus in on inheritance and then in the, in the next lecture, we'll cover the uh, blueprint. Remember, we can make a copy of, a DNA, of another DNA strand by using a template strand. And like uh, Watson and Crick postulated, that's how the cell does it. And so if we took a double-stranded piece of DNA uh, the cell can make a copy of it. In order to do so, though, it has to gain access to those nitrogenous bases that are in the middle of that double-stranded helix. So it recruits an enzyme called helicase. Recall that enzymes are proteins that reduce the activation energy required to do a molecular reaction. And in this way, the cell is able to orchestrate which reactions happen by controlling the speed at which reactions occur. Anytime you see the 
the uh, ace at the end of a word in biology, it almost always means that that uh, word represents a enzyme. So helicase and then ASE, so you should have an indication that this would be an enzyme. This helicase will bind to DNA at a site called the origin of replication. This is where our replication is going to begin. And it separates the strands of DNA. So it will work down and unzip the DNA like a zipper. Um, however, uh, it can't keep the uh, DNA strands from reannealing to each other. These nitrogen spaces want to form these hydrogen bonds with each other. So single stranded binding proteins are recruited and bind to these single strands and keep them from being able to reattach to each other. Also, another uh, enzyme called primase creates a short stretch of RNA. We'll discuss RNA later on, but it's another type of, uh, of uh, genetic material. And this RNA is called a primer. And these primers attach the DNA template strand. So we need primase for both uh, strands, the top strand and the bottom strand. And this primase uh, lays down a primer of RNA that always starts with a phosphate group. And remember the phosphate groups are attached to the five prime end and ends with a ribose sugar, or in other words, the three prime end. So in that sense, RNA primase will always write five prime to three prime. And it's writing based upon what it's reading. And so it reads in the opposite direction because these two strands are anti-parallel. It must start um, from the three prime end and move to the five prime end in its reading. So enzymes involved in DNA replication always read the DNA template from three prime to five prime and write the new strand in five prime to three prime. So if you were to look at this depiction of the primases, you should be able to predict which way they'll travel by looking at the strand they're on. If we look at the top strand, it goes five prime on the left side and three prime on the right side. And so that primase should move from right to left because it's reading three prime to five prime. The bottom strand is written, it has three prime on the far left side and five prime on the far right side. And so that means that this primase on the bottom strand is gonna go from left to right. It's gonna read three to five. And it's, as it's reading, it's gonna start writing the new nitrogen spaces, five prime to three prime. So it should look something like this. See that three prime to five prime on the top? And it builds the anti-parallel strand, five prime to three prime. And same with the bottom strand. Five prime to three prime is the new strand, reading three prime to five prime. So uh, now that we have our RNA primer, uh, we're ready to continue our synthesis of DNA. Checkpoint two, what type of bonds are being broken in this step? Okay, now let's start to compare the, uh, the structure of RNA versus DNA. DNA, as you recall, is short for deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA is short for ribonucleic acid. So RNA's sugar, the ribose, does not come in the deoxy form. So it has a extra oxygen attached to its sugar. The other thing we should note is that RNA typically comes as a single strand. Um, so we have just drawn here a single strand of RNA. DNA usually comes in the form of a double strand. And finally, um, RNA has a different set of nucleotide bases. The nucleotide base thymine in DNA is replaced with a nucleotide base uracil. So DNA has CGs and ATs, 
and RNA has CGs and AUs. Anytime you see a T in a DNA strand, you can always imagine that that would be replaced with a U in an RA strand. And let's look here at the sugars. So deoxyribose versus ribose, as you can see on the second prime carbon, there, instead of having a hydrogen group, there is what's called a hydroxyl group or an OH group. So it's not missing an oxygen and it's ribose sugar. Checkpoint three, which of the following is true about DNA or RNA nucleotides? So even though RNA has a different structure than DNA, it is still capable of base pairing between the two. Um, the fundamental difference here is going to be that instead of A binding to a T in RNA, A will be binding to a U. But you can still, uh, you still use the same processes of uh, writing a copy um, using a template strand. Just know that you're going to replace a T with a U. Um, some students get a little confused here when they see this A here or sorry, when they see this T here, they try writing, writing a U for its uh, complement here. But remember that T's don't bind to U's, they are replaced by U's. So T is still gonna bind to an A, uh, and RNA adenine didn't go anywhere. So T would create an A if you read this and wrote a new strand of RNA. But um, an A would bind to a U. All right, so the primase has created that short stretch of RNA. We called that short stretch of RNA a primer because what it's doing is it's priming the well um, for, so to speak, of DNA synthesis. Uh, we have to observe the overall direction of replication on a DNA strand. So we can see that this uh, helicase is going to zip down this DNA and the top strand and the bottom strand. As they're unzipped, we're exposing uh, more nucleotide bases. And we have another enzyme we have to keep track of. This enzyme is called DNA polymerase three. Uh, it's called DNA polymerase because it polymerizes uh, new strands of DNA instead of RNA. And it is named, it is called three because it was the third polymerase discovered. Um, each one of these polymerases serves a, a slightly different function. This one is very important in replication. So this DNA polymerase three adds DNA nucleotides to the three prime end of the RNA primer. So it's going to be replicating like we'll show in this image. So here DNA polymerase three attaches and it's going to replicate in the uh, five prime to three prime direction. So let's go back and revisit this again. So DNA polymerase three uh, is capable of polymerizing, but there's a problem in that it cannot do a cold start. It actually needs the presence of these primers in order to begin the process. And so DNA polymerase three is looking for these uh, primers in order to bind to the DNA. And just like all other enzymes, it's going to read in the three prime to five prime direction. So if we look at the top strand, Here's the three prime end, and to the left is the five prime end. So in order to read, it's gotta to travel towards the five prime end. So it's traveling down this way, and it's reading these nitrogen spaces as it goes. It's going to create a new nitrogen space as it reads. So it's reading three prime to five prime, and because this new strand is anti-parallel, it's going to create a five prime to three prime strand down here on the bottom it will look essentially like this bottom strand will look. See how this is five prime and this is three prime? 
it's going to build a strand that should essentially look like that strand and be in the same anti-parallel uh, direction. So let's look at this again. Here we have that DNA polymerase traveling in three prime to five prime direction, building that new strand in five prime to three prime direction. So there's something interesting going on with this bottom strand. This DNA polymerase three, it attaches to the primer, but it has to move away from the overall direction of replication because it has to read three prime to five prime. So it's going in the wrong direction, right? So here we have our new DNA strands, um, which is great, but we're going to have to work on that bottom strand. Something else that is really nice about DNA polymerase three is it also proofreads and replaces incorrect bases just added. So if it makes a mistake, it has the capability of catching that mistake and repairing that mistake. All right, so let's continue this DNA synthesis. So imagine our DNA is further unzipped with helicase. Um, as the helix unwinds and the ladder separates, the DNA polymerases can keep creating this top strand continually. So there's nothing really getting in the way of this top strand from synthesizing further and further. However, the process for the bottom strand is not contiguous. As you can see, eventually that DNA polymerase will reach the end here and will uh, drop off. It can't continue copying in the proper direction. So this process will start over when a newly exposed piece of DNA on that bottom strand um, attaches to a primase and the primase lays down a new primer. So here's our primase going to read three prime to five prime, write five prime to three prime. And now the DNA polymerase three can follow in and bind to that primer and read three prime to five prime and build five prime to three prime until eventually it reaches the previous primer, which also causes it to dislocate. And there we go. And this process continues with a complete strand on the top and fragments that are formed on the bottom. And here we go with the DNA polymerase three forming another fragment. All right. So how does biology solve the issue of this um, fragment that is formed? Um, well, these fragments are called Okazaki fragments named after the scientist who discovered them. And what was discovered is that we have one strand which is a little ahead of the other strand. The one strand that can synthesize in the direction of the replication fork is called the leading strand because it's in the lead in terms of synthesis here. The strand that has to synthesize in the opposite direction of the replication fork is a little bit behind and it's called the lagging strand. Have no fear though, uh, biology has found a way to deal with this and it has a still another polymerase we need to be aware of called DNA polymerase one. DNA polymerase one fixes this issue by cutting out the RNA primers that were made. So on the leading strand, we have to cut out that first primer and it does so gladly and it replaces them with DNA nucleotides, again in the same direction, five prime to three prime. Oop. So let's do our next checkpoint, checkpoint four. 
DNA polymerases writes blank and reads blank. Back to the story. We had our DNA polymerase one, which removed the, prim the primers and filled them with, instead of RNA, it replaced them with DNA. However, these Okazaki fragments still have this little nick, this little notch here of missing nucleotides that um, is the space where the previous DNA polymerase three couldn't fully reach the, uh, the very last nitrogenous base and seal this, uh, this backbone here. So, um, oh, I, actually I misspoke. It does, it does kind, it's not really represented here in this image, but it does fill in everything, but it's missing that final phosphodiester bond. So all of the nitrogenous bases are actually there. It just doesn't have that final phosphodiester bond that links these two fragments together. So we have still another enzyme and this enzyme ligates those two together. And that's why it's called ligase. So ligase repairs these uh, broken phosphodiester bonds that are referred to as NICs. You can imagine if you came in there with a pair of scissors and you cut one side of the phosphate, um, you would form a NIC in the backbone. So it repairs these NICs in the backbone of the new DNA between the Okazaki fragments. Here's our ligase and it just seals it up like that. Okay, and now we have a full copy of each the top strand and the bottom strand. So now I'd like to share with you a video that depicts this DNA replication. And this is of a uh, eukaryote, as you can see with the nucleus. Those are the histones you see, these round balls here, and the DNA, which is super coiled around them and around each other. Transcription we'll talk about next time is the synthesis of a, uh, what's called an RNA strand for uh, turning into a protein. And this is how uh, things are moved in and out of the nucleus through these nucleus gateways. And this is what those gateways look like on the outside of the nucleus. So there is the chromatin. There are the histones or nucleosome complexes being formed. And they can come together in order to form even more dense, uh, an even more dense structure of DNA called chromosomes. We're gonna jump forward a little bit. That's mitosomiosis. Okay, here is replication. So here's your DNA polymerase three. And on one side, you can see we have the leading strand moving towards the replication fork. And the top is the lagging strand. So here's the leading strand here just being actively synthesized and here's the lagging strand building in the opposite five prime to three prime location running into the last Okazaki fragment and then falling off. <laughs>
Okay, that was a lot of fun. Let's get back to our PowerPoint presentation. Um, in this process that we've just learned about, uh, we have DNA replication occurring on both the top strand and the bottom strand of that double helix, uh, double stranded DNA. Um, in this way, we preserve the old strands of DNA in the process of making new strands of DNA. And because of that, we call this semi-conservative and that the new strand of DNA is part old and part new. So we can imagine here we have the two old strands and in the middle is the synthesis of the new strands in the five prime to three prime direction. Checkpoint five, explain in your own words why one of the DNA strands is replicated continuously while the other is replicated in fragments. So that covers our discussion of inheritance with DNA, um, namely DNA replication, how DNA molecules are, are copied and replicated. Now, in the next section, we are going to discuss the blueprint. Um, so DNA is a, uh, a molecule that stores information. Um, specifically, it has information there for converting the DNA code into proteins. And uh, this process is called transcription and translation. So we want to know how this information that's stored in DNA is put into action. And why do cells use this system at all? The reason is we want to preserve the master copy. So imagine if I, the instructor, only had one copy of the lab manual. I would never loan that lab manual to any one student to use. Instead, I would, I would make copies of the information for each student and hand them out. DNA is much more stable than RNA because DNA lacks the hydroxyl group, the OH group on the two prime carbon of its sugar base that ribose has. The hydroxyl group is more reactive than hydrogen in the CH bond on the two prime carbon. And therefore, the extra hydroxyl group renders RNA more chemically reactive. Um, if we look at the concept of transcription, it's the synthesis of a complementary RNA molecule from a DNA template. And translation is the synthesis of protein from information encoded in the RNA copy. So if I was to give you a handout on how to do a particular lab activity, you could potentially make you know, a product in the lab based upon the handout I made from the original manual. This is really important because proteins are the workhorses of the cell. They are largely responsible for encoding traits. And sometimes the process stops after transcription though to make a functional RNA molecule. So this adds another layer of control um, of what reactions take place in the cell. So in order to um, increase the reaction rate, we use enzymes to do that. Well, in order to make an enzyme, you have to have an RNA code. In order to make an RNA code, you have to be allowed to make it from the DNA code. So this is a whole extra level of regulation of processes inside of the cell. This is called the basic dogma of biology, and that is that DNA is the blueprint in which, through transcription, an RNA script is made. This RNA script then goes to the ribosomes in order to be translated or in order for that information to be used by the ribosome to make a protein that is based on that code. And we will discuss this a lot more in our second lecture on microbial genetics. And so thank you all so much for joining me and we'll see you on the next round.